Mary's brother. Let's pray for a moment. Pray the Lord's prayer. As Jesus taught his church to pray, let's pray. Our Father, Lord of heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, if you've noticed, our topic deals with heroes or heroism. And actually, I know I've talked about heroes before, and, uh, but I don't know if I've used this text with it with you. And I've read this text before, but I don't know if I've talked about heroes using this text with you before. I don't believe so. But uh, uh, this is a very familiar scripture, the Transfiguration. Both passages we're about to read from Matthew as well as from 2 Peter. The lectionary scripture today. Very, very special scriptures. And the Gospels, the other Gospels carry this story also. So if it's not one year, it's, a, it's another year you have uh, the uh, story of the Transfiguration and uh, uh, conveyed through one of the other Gospels. Uh, the whole concept and idea of, of a hero is uh, one of courage and, uh, and, and quality and those, when you look at the definitions, that's what you're going to find. And we, the whole point this morning is that our ultimate hero, ultimate hero is Christ. That is the point. This passage we're about to read is one of those great transition passages. And what we mean by that is, this is a transition passage, moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There are many of them. They're in the Old Testament, they're in the New Testament, the Gospels, but in, in, there's there's some maybe more important than other that are others that are transitional passages. The birth narrative, one of them, of course, moving into the New Testament. But this one is one of the key stories, one of the key events in the life of Christ. And, and it's, 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 it's marvelous to me to hear all of the commentaries or see the commentaries and read the commentaries on what happened this particular day and how some of them agree and some of them do not agree. The point is, it happens for a specific reason. So instead of just rattling on and talking about the transfiguration, let's read what happened and why the church honors this particular day. In Matthew's Gospel, the 17th chapter, beginning in verse 1, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became dazzling white. Get the picture now? This is an amazing event happening to a physical person. But it's happening. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Two Old Testament figures, been dead 500 years. But there they are, on this Mount of Transfiguration, talking with Jesus as Jesus is illuminated before them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that for us to uh, be here. If you wish, I'll make three dwellings here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. We know whose voice that was. The voice of God. Listen to my son. When the disciples heard this, they fell on the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and said to them, and touched them saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they came down, they saw no one. And when they uh, looked, they saw no one except Jesus himself. The others were gone. 
And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. In one of the other Gospels, that tells us that the topic of conversation on the Mount of Transfiguration was, was the dead and resurrection. Now, we switch over to uh, 2 Peter, the uh, uh, first chapter. Now, Peter is one of the ones that's on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. This was so important to him, he wanted people to know that he actually saw this event, like we shared with children a few moments ago. Not hearsay, I saw it. And this is what Peter says, beginning with verse 16 of the first chapter, is an eyewitness of Christ's glory. For we did not follow, follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have been eyewitnesses to his majesty. Eyewitnesses. Get the picture. For he received honor and glory from God, the Father. And the voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, God's glory saying, This is my Son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice, Peter, James, and John. We heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. We saw it. We were there. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First, of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no one prophecy ever came by a human will. But man and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is the Word of God for the people of God and thanks be to God. Okay, this is a Wonderful transition to the passage about the greatest hero of all time. It's been said that people need heroes. They need not individuals they can worship and honor and, and adore. And uh, one of the sad things about, I guess, modern culture is some of the celebrity heroes that not just the children now, but a lot of us have. So I'll ask you, who is your hero? One of these sports figures? Maybe a movie star? Political leader? Who knows, maybe a religious leader? A doctor? This whole concept of uh, idol worship or uh, uh, is not new. Um, because we seem to have a need in us to look up to someone along the way. And uh, uh, here's something that I found very interesting. This comes from the book entitled uh, Best and Worst and, uh, by Bruce Fulton. He said, and this is about Marie Antoinette and how this whole concept of idol worship is not new to us. We think our children today are the only ones that are, are, are follow celebrities. They're the only ones that are, are followers instead of leaders. Listen to this. This tendency to worship celebrities is not entirely new. Marie Antoinette, the first lady, Louis XVI, was a celebrity style maker in the 18th century. If she styled her wig in a particular fashion, all the ladies of the court were soon wearing their hair the same way. Now, this is what's really neat. When she became pregnant, the best dressed women of Paris and Versailles started wearing cushions, cushions under their gowns in imitation. And for nine months, they inserted larger and larger cushions to keep pace with Marie's expansion. Then suddenly, with the birth of her son, cushions became passe. <laughs> People have always emulated those in celebrity status, I guess we could say. Uh, there are some legitimate heroes in our world 
There are some people who live courageously, compassionately, live meaningful lives. You have your list. I have my list. When I start thinking of my list of heroes, I'm telling you, you would not be impressed. Some of them were quite modest and frail people, but yet they raised really high with me in hero status. They were very, very significant, very special. We need heroes to inspire us. Many of these people are not known by the general public. That's well and good also. But the world is much better off because of them. Here's something to think about. Here's an illustration. I, I like this illustration. You think about it for just a moment or two. And don't spend too much time. Too often, we judge a person's worth, the contributions to society, by the amount of flowers that are at their funeral. Think about it. I know we don't talk about that. We don't need to be talking about that. But sometimes we're so narrow that we do that. We're so shallow that we do that. We judge a person's worth by something like that. <laughs> Knowing we should. But here's the flip side to that. Here's a little flip side to that metaphorical language. For every flower that grows, that has to start with a seed, correct? It has to be a seed. And I would submit to you this for every flower offered in memory or in honor of someone, a seed is planted also. Think about it. They don't come to us haphazardly. With whom do you identify? Who do you truly want to be like? Who's your hero? Now, to the text, to this wonderful scripture, Elijah and Moses are with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. For every Jewish boy that would be Jesus, Jesus, Peter, James, and John. There were four of them that go up the side of that mountain. As they go up the Mount of Transfiguration on that day, when they make their, when they go up the mountain, I wonder who their heroes were. Chances are Elijah and Moses were real high on their list. Any Jewish child growing up, going to uh, 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 studying and, and, and uh, under a rabbi, would know that. Elijah and Moses and who they represented. That this would be this would be our heroes, the heroes of, of our faith. As a matter of fact, these two heroes of the faith are recognized by three of the major religions of the world: Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They all recognize Elijah and Moses. They're that significant. They're that powerful. Moses gives the commandments, and Elijah uh, is the great hero. Of the prophet. It's significant that Jesus is on that mountain with these two prophetic figures who are heroes to all Jewish people. It's significant that they're there. And when they're there, they start having this conversation. I mean, this is a this is an interesting event. Verse 4. Peter said to the Lord, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Uh, if you wish, I'll make three dwellings here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, the voice said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Skip on down to verse 7. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. In verse 9. And as they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. He's going to die. And he's going to experience the Easter experience. When they came down the mountain, now, it, we said a few moments ago who their hero was as they go up the mountain. Elijah well, and Moses, good Jewish boy. Now as they come down the mountain, who do you think is their hero? This is why this is a great transition passage. Their hero is Jesus, who was transfigured before their eyes. 
with these two prophets of old. Jesus is now the hero, moving from Old Testament to New Testament in a very dramatic, beautiful fashion. This is the Mount of Transfiguration experience. If you do not have a hero, I recommend one. Best of all, best of for all time hero. If a hero is someone you look up to, identify with, even try to emulate, recommend Jesus. For a lot of reasons. And this scripture, just like this scripture, is so important for a lot of reasons. This is transitional scripture from the Old Testament. New Testament. But we recommend Jesus for a couple of reasons and that's what we want to focus on in the last of the few minutes that we have left together this morning. One of the reasons we want to recognize Jesus as our hero is other heroes that we look at, that we lift up, that we talk about they'll let you down. That's just a matter of fact. That's not trying to diminish anyone's value or position. We're all still human beings and we all still make mistakes. Everyone's flawed. Everyone. Not a perfect one among us. There was a time when heroes could be invented. Now, the greatest generation as they were growing up in the early part of the 20th century, heroes were invented by the comic strips all the time. Superman, all those wonderful heroes. The Lone Ranger, Johnny Weissmiller as Tarzan. My daddy always talked about all those cowboy figures that he would go to the theater and watch and that he loved them. These were his heroes. These were manufactured heroes and, uh, and they could be invented. Those were more maybe naive times for us when the press didn't report all of the uh, hero shortcomings. Then, a certain, certain time in history, I don't know when it happened, 50s, 60s, whatever, whenever it happened, everything changes in our culture and things aren't as innocent as they used to be. And it became really popular not to hide the shortcomings of those heroes, but talk about them, you know. I'll give you a few examples. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, the home run king. Uh, by the public, he was just a wonderful hero for the public, but his own personal life was pretty messy. It was pretty bad. You know, JFK, wonderful president. Gone down in history as one of the greats. But his own personal life was kind of chaotic. A few years before JFK, there was a FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You know, the public didn't even know that he couldn't walk for the most part. The press did their best to hide that fact. Think about it. The press did their best to hide the fact that Roosevelt couldn't walk. He was confined to a heel wheelchair for most of his term, terms being president. The press did this, okay? <coughs> Times were when the media would exaggerate strengths and ignore weaknesses. Now let me tell you, that day is over. I guess you know. That's not with us anymore. Nowadays things are reversed. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are a lot of people in the media that are, uh, they actually seek weaknesses and try to minimize the strengths of those would-be or hopeful. Well, what heroes, whether they're in politics, uh, 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 actors, actresses, sports, wherever. You see this in our culture. Even then, we don't know if all of what's being said is real. Is it hype? Is it public relations? I've coined a phrase in my life, surface hero. Uh, you won't probably find that in any dictionary where it's just mm, a phrase like surface heroes. There are a lot of those in the world. Superficial people, superficial hero, have the right labels. 
do the right things, say the right things, but it's all surface. Well, one of the reasons we need to make Jesus our ultimate hero is that other heroes will let you down. Because they're frail human beings. Another reason to make Jesus your hero is that Jesus Christ can make a hero out of you. Jesus Christ can make a better person out of you. Don't you want to be? For the sake of all that's right? When you look to Christ as an object of worship, you identify with. You seek to emulate, to imitate. And we're drawn to Christ. Here's an example of an interesting person. I'm glad it's all of us. Some of you know the name. Some of you might not know the name. This was in a book entitled Pastors Be Encouraged. And uh, her, her story is just a magnificent story. She's a, she's a unique hero. She, Gladys Allworth was a missionary to China uh, <laughs> during World War II as, and was forced to leave her mission work when the Japanese invaded Yangshin. In fleeing certain death, she led nearly a hundred orphans over the mountain to free China away from the invaders. As, as it was a uh, frightening journey, and at times she was burdened by despair. One morning, this is what's really neat, one morning after a sleepless night, fearing that they would never reach safety, she shared her hopelessness with the orphans. Hundred of them. By the way, there was a movie made about this several years ago, and uh, Ingrid Bergman played this lady, Gladys Oliver. This is what happened. A little 13-year-old girl in a moment of despair, a 13-year-old girl reminded Gladys of their much-loved story about Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea in this moment of despair. And Gladys painfully says, Yes, but I'm not Moses, she cries out to this child. And of course you aren't, the little girl responded. But Jehovah is still God. Out of the mouths of babies. That, of course, she was mighty with the King James with Jehovah. Of course, I'm not Billy Graham. Of course, you're not maybe the hero that you'd like to be. But God is still God. That doesn't change. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of this text. It's why worship. Well, it's why, uh, it's the point. Worshiping of heroes, if, uh, what, what's the whole point of it if it can't help us to become one? Like Christ. Here's another story. I never did think much of Winston Churchill, <laughs> but he was a hero. In the, in the book entitled Jesus by Max Atkins, he tells this story about Churchill, and it really endeared me to this, this individual. Listen to this. Winston Churchill, the paragraph. Winston Churchill knew the difference between celebrities and heroes. In the summer of 1941, Sergeant James Allen Ward was awarded the Victoria Cross for climbing out onto the wing of the Willington Bomber at 13,000 feet above the ground to extinguish a fire in the starboard engine. Hard to believe. Secured only by a rope around his waist, he managed to smother the fire and return along the wing to the aircraft's cabin. Now, Churchill, an admirer, as well as a performer of swashbuckling exploits, summoned this shy New Zealander to 10 Downing Street. Ward, this man, struck dumb with awe in Churchill's presence. The presence of Winston Churchill. He was unable to answer the Prime Minister's question. Churchill surveyed this unhappy hero with some compassion. You must feel very humble and awkward in my presence, he said. Yes, sir, man of the war. I really do. 
then you can imagine how humble and awkward I feel in your presence. Return to Churchill. Winston Churchill knew the value of a hero. Churchill was in the presence of a real hero. As the disciples are making their way down that mount of transfiguration, we know who their hero was as they were going up. Elijah and Moses. Old Testament. But as they're coming down, there's a great transition that's taking place here. And their hero is Jesus. Christ the King. He was beyond celebrity status. He was beyond hero status. Well, he was Lord. He was the Master. The King. We have a Sunday called Christ the King Sunday. All of these wonderful Sundays that we adore and worship Jesus are significant and important to us. Christ can enter our lives and transform us into heroes? Maybe. Maybe. But it's about being Christ-centered and Christ in our lives. If we'll rise, if we'll rise, wise, Christ will be our hero. And if we're wise, we'll try to emulate Christ and be heroes. And remember what Christ has done for us, what made available to us. As one season begin, ends, another season begins in the Christian church. This is the Sunday of the Transfiguration. So much happened on that day. It's hard to even imagine Jesus' dazzling appearance changing. It was to give them a, a vision of what he was going to look like in glory. The resurrected Christ. To, to give them a vision of that. Elijah and Moses, Old Testament heroes were there. But as they come down the mountain, they only have one hero, one cross, one Lord, one Savior. Jesus Christ, still on the throne, still saving souls today. And may Christ have his way with you and yours this great day. Let's have our closing and invitation.